professor here at the Price School at USC. Uh, I run the Bedrosian Center, which is a center focused on governance. And a lot of what we talk about uh, in thinking about governance is how do sectors fit together and how do we uh, get policies that actually move the dial and have impact, uh, which is a natural uh, connection with this panel, um, which is about impact investing. You know, I think this is actually a really important question and it's something that will be useful to talk about. Uh, in the last plenary, there were a number of uh, comments and questions and, and little side things that related directly to what we're doing here and uh, the series of uh, sessions that we're having on philanthropic innovation. Questions such as, you know, what is impact investing? Um, which is a really important question and, it's, and you know, impact investing has been hot for many years, but I still don't feel like we have clear consensus on that. So hopefully that's something that, uh, that we can get more clarity, for, clarity on. Um, a, a second question is, is how do you learn from the outside? And how do you, as uh, philanthropy, philanthropic organizations, take what you've learned, take the innovations, uh, and make sure that they uh, translate into real impacts? And, and I'm hoping that we can have um, some conversation on that. Um, what we've done in this panel is br bring together three people who have a tremendous e experience and perspectives on um, impact investing, uh, the nuts and bolts, as well as some higher level philosophies about uh, how you go about doing this, uh, what should be done, and how should we structure our enterprises to make sure that we uh, achieve our maximum impact. I'm just going to introduce them by name and organization. Uh, you have their bios in your packets, um, and so I'm going to just get right to it. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Paula uh, Goldman. Uh, Paula's from a mid-year network and uh, has arrived just yesterday from Delhi. Um, and so um, I'm hoping that the time lag uh, will leave her um, less filtered and, and, and her responses <laughs> and we'll get her some good things from you so 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 thank I you. I asked him to keep it lively so I don't fall asleep. For being here. Um, I've got a little soft shoe routine if it gets to, to a problem. Um, second is Steve Goldberg. Steve is with Caffeinated Capital LLC. Um, he has done a lot of work with the Social Finance Fund in the UK. Uh, thank you for being here as well. And then third is Jessica La, La Barbara. You got it. La Barbara, That's not it? Barbara. <laughs> Technical. She'll, uh, all right. Uh, who is uh, with the Nonprofit Finance Fund uh, and is out here in LA. So thank you all. Um, what I thought what we would do for this session is do this in four parts. Uh, the first part is really to ask each of our speakers to provide some, uh, some perspectives on what impact investing is and how they see it, its evolution or how it has evolved in the sector over the last you know, five to ten years to get us to where we are right now. Um, and as part of that conversation to say something about uh, the lessons that have been learned that have informed that evolution uh, so that we can make sure we're, we're, we're learning the things that we're supposed to. Uh, the second is really to uh, have, have a conversation about um, some, some examples that are illustrative of um, how you do this effectively. And those examples could either be positive examples but also some things that haven't worked out as well as we all know that failures are often where most learning, our most effective learning happens. And then the third thing I wanted to have our panelists uh, reflect on uh, is really oriented toward you. And I asked each of them to think about um, two takeaways that they would hope that everyone would take out of here uh, in considering what impact investing would be. And then we'll turn it around and you'll be about us and we'll open this up for questions. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get all this done in 75 minutes. Um, and uh, I'm really hopeful that this will be a lively and interesting conversation. All right, so let's get to the first question. Um, and I will, you know, we haven't orchestrated this, so if someone wants to go first, that would be great. But, but give me some thoughts or give us some thoughts about uh, what impact investing is and, and how it's, it's conceptually evolved in the field and, and what are some of the main lessons and takeaways? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start on this one? Sure. I think it's sort of most in your wheelhouse. And yeah, I can kind of sure, come sure, up. sure. It might actually be helpful for me to, to sort of 
tell the story of, it, of impact investing evolution through our own evolution at a Midyear Network. Um, so, so for those of you uh, who are not familiar, Midyear Network uh, was founded in 2004 by Pierre Omidyar, who started eBay. Um, he had, before starting Omidyar Network, started a family foundation when he had a liquidity event with eBay. Um, and as he sort of, you know, began operations, he, uh, he, he, he had this, um, he started to have this kind of feeling of dissonance where he had on the one side his family foundation and he was making grants. And then on the other side he had his private investments and he felt that a lot of his investments he was making specifically for social impact. He had watched eBay, for example, grow um, with just $10,000 of startup capital and create more than a million jobs, a lot of which went to underserved populations. And so he thought to himself, why is it that there's kind of this assumption that philanthropy is about you make money on one side and then philanthropically you give it back. Why can you not use more market-based tools and for-profit tools to create social impact? So sort of questioning the whole structure. Dissolved the Family Foundation and created Omidyar Network as a hybrid entity where we can do both grants and for-profit investments under the same house. Um, and so, so formally, we all actually work for an LLC versus a foundation, but we have a foundation checkbook. So those for-profit investments are what are called impact investments, right? So the formal definition of impact investments are investments that have, you know, the, the, where the primary intention is to create social or environmental impact and also a financial return of at least a return of principal all the way up to market rate market rates of return, and in that formal definition, it can encompass everything from early stage equity, like we are kind of more of a traditional VC player, to debt and guarantees and lots of different instruments. So, so that happened in 2004. Around 2008, uh, the term impact investing got invented. Um, and that was largely through uh, kind of a gathering led by uh, Rockefeller and others, by Jessica's uh, CEO, Anthony, um, that kind of they saw this sort of growing energy around this idea of using for-profit investing for social impact. Um, they were like, let's, let's call it something. Let's organize the industry. Let's create the Global Impact Investing Network. And, uh, and since then, you know, the, the term has been getting a tremendous amount of buzz and the field continues to grow. Um, studies are showing sort of like incremental jumps of a couple billion dollars of investing per year, at least within kind of the US and Europe. Um, our own evolution though is really interesting. So we started out saying, okay, we're gonna do grants and we're gonna do investments and probably we're gonna do them about 50-50. Um, and, and the thinking was, on the one hand, you know, do investments and do them like you would do any other investment. You're going to expect market rates of return and nothing less because anything less might be sloppy investing. So don't, don't think about the fact that, don't, don't try to go down the slippery slope of saying, well, this is an impact-based organization, so maybe I can accept a less than a market rate of return. And then on the other hand, we were on the other side of our house and like, we're just going to give away all our money. But we're not comfortable with the stuff in the middle. Right? And we started, we started looking at that over a couple of years and thinking to ourselves, okay, there's something wrong here. Right? Like why on the one hand are we saying a for-profit business, you should only get a market rate of return, but then on the other hand, we're totally comfortable with 100% loss of principle. Um, and we started realizing that these two fields should not be separate. And instead of thinking about individual firms, like investing in a solar lantern firm that provides lighting for the 1.6 billion people who don't have access to electricity, or a medical technology firm that creates devices for people that live far from hospitals, it's like, okay, you can cherry pick these firms one by one. But actually, if you think about grants and for-profit investments being complementary, you can help build these entire industries together, which is where we landed on what we call a sector-based approach to impact investing. So what we do now is instead of just picking firms one by one, we have concentrated on a few key industries. So financial inclusion, people that don't have access to formal banking, checking, financial services, uh, medical technology, education, low-cost education for people that are excluded basically from high quality education, access to high quality education. 
Um, and in each of these fields, we not only you know, do high quality for profit investments, but we use our grant funds to help build the industry, especially when we're talking about about half of our work or more is in emerging economies. And these are, by definition, we're talking about markets where there's just a lot of barriers, you know, that the roads aren't working, the, pol the policies are not, uh, the regulations are either overly constrictive or not helpful, et cetera, et cetera. So we, so we use our grants to help with, you know, collective action within the industry to get a regulatory policy to make sure that consumers are protected, um, to help with training of skilled employees for medical technology companies, et cetera. Um, and we have found that by using these two strategies in combination, we're able to increase our impact and not just think about the direct impact of any individual firm, but the systems level impact of moving forward an entire industry that the market it, on its own would probably not catalyze. Um, and that to us is sort of the true promise of impact investing not this kind of the marketing about it, which is like, oh, you can have your cake and eat it too, like get a return, get your social impact, you know, um, which is a lot of how it's been pitched kind of in the mainstream press. But really actually the hard work of saying, there are these people who are excluded from access to services that markets can deliver. And in, in kind of contra in contrast to this sort of traditional notion of, um, let's fix a market failure. It's actually let's catalyze a market so that it will work for these people. And that's where I'll stop for now. So there's a lot there, <laughs> um, and you know you had a lot of issues around organizational structure just alone, which is extremely interesting. Yeah. But then the notion of um, this vertical integration of your all of your financial activities, whether they be grants or uh, the, the impact investing, um, which there's a lot we could unpack there. So yeah. I'm going to hold off on okay. that. I have about six questions here. <laughs> um, so uh, so let's, let's, let's move on. I let's can pick up on that because I think it's a nice um, sort of transition point to where a nonprofit finance fund comes into the picture and our trajectory around impact investing as well. So nonprofit finance fund is an intermediary nonprofit CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution that for the last 32 years has been lending money to nonprofit organizations throughout the United States. And not to affordable housing developers, but to human service providers, arts organizations, charter schools, health clinics around the country. In many ways, you could say that the loans we were making to these nonprofit organizations was impact investing, right? That we were looking for a return on our investment in nonprofit organizations that were doing social good. And I apologize, getting over a bit of a cold here. In many ways, folks would say that traditional type of PRI investing, the pr program-related investment that nonprofit finance fund receives from, say, California Community Foundation or the California Endowment to in turn relend to Project Angel Food, for instance, here in Los Angeles, is itself an example of an impact investment. Similarly, you see the sort of traditional impact investing where a for-profit investment is made into an organization that does social good. And you know, another traditional example one might say locally is Isidore Recycling. For folks who aren't familiar with this organization, it's a local organization that has folks who have been previously incarcerated um, working to uh, recycle electronic waste. So this is you know, a double bottom line investment. And in many ways, that's been what impact investing, the, the sort of coined term, has been from 2008 to, I'd say, 2010 or so. In some ways, I think what Steve will likely talk most about, and I'll leave him, him time to do this as well, is that this idea of impact investing has been expanded in the last two years by a, a new innovation in the market called social impact bonds and pay for success financing. This is an idea that not only can we invest in social enterprise to generate a return, so we don't necessarily need there to be a revenue stream that can pay us back, but we can also think about monetizing cost savings that are provided by early intervention or preventative services. And I'll kind of leave it there, Steve. I'm sure that you'll, you'll take that up. <laughs> um, one other thing that I wanted to pick up on from Paula's comment, though, was this idea of the vertical, vertical integration of capital, You know what some might say is structured finance, what others might call stacked capital. And this is the idea that you know, a grant or a loan um, don't need to be made independently, but rather perhaps we can leverage 
those forms of investments and have greater impact. So one quick example I'll give of this is locally here in California, many might be familiar with the California Freshworks Initiative. And this is an idea that was put forward by the California Endowment um, to basically help them further their goal of building healthy communities throughout the state. Now they realize that in order to build healthy communities, folks particularly in low-income areas needed to have access to healthy foods. And what we know exists in many places in California, something that we've coined as food deserts, right? And it's obviously going to be difficult to address health inequities if there are these food deserts located throughout the state. So they realized that even with a substantial grant investment from their own endowment, they couldn't address this issue. And so borrowing on the intellectual capital of the reinvestment fund in Pennsylvania, the human capital of NCB Capital here in California who administers the fund, and the financial capital of numerous impact investors, philanthropies, commercial banks, and philanthropic partners, they put together a pool of grant money, technical assistance dollars, subordinated debts, loan guarantees, and commercial capital to essentially create a $264 million pool that can support the amelioration of these food deserts throughout California. Nonprofit Finance Fund has done a very similar thing in New York City. In 2010, we set out to take dollars from the Clark Foundation and uh, other foundations in New York to essentially lend money to human service organizations who were having delays in their contract reimbursements from New York City. These were human service organizations that, let's think about 2009, 2010, were facing an incredible increase in demand for their services. And at the same time, the government shortfalls were meaning that they were having to wait three, six, sometimes even nine months to get repaid for the services that they are providing. Nonprofit Finance Fund has done a survey of the nonprofit sector for the last four years. And we know that routinely nonprofit organizations have, most of them, 55% 50, or, or more in some years, have less than three months of cash on hand. Now, for some in the room, that might be just a wonky statistical figure. That means they've got three months to keep their doors open until new revenue comes in. Okay, so we're taking those organizations that are already stressed, and we're saying, can we lend money to them, right? The answer was no. These were not organizations that were financially stable enough for us to provide working capital loans to. The answer, in many ways, was the evolution and, and us reframing the question that we asked. So when Anthony Buglevine talks about this, he often says we need to be asking the right questions. This is not just about where can we place a loan or an investment, but what is the social issue and challenge that we're trying to address? And so here we realize this is an incredibly weak safety net system that we have in New York City, and how do we collectively look at strengthening that? So similar to the Freshworks Initiative, we too partnered with large city, found, um, city government agencies who provided guarantees for commercial banks to provide loans, foundations who provided subordinated debt and technical assistance, or dollars for technical assistance, to create what we call kind of a capital, complete capital approach to addressing this larger issue. And so I think the evolution that when we talk about impact investing is not just from a financial investment into an organization, but it's also this idea of can we come together, can we bring complete capital to address some of these social challenges, and also, you know, what I think, to, uh, Steve, to tee you up a little bit, can we think about not just looking at a financial return in strict dollar terms, but can we also think about monetizing cost savings from providing services that reduce a back-end cost later on down the line? Thank you, Jessica. I just wanted to jump and ask one follow-up question, sure. which is really talks about your last point and the mix between financial uh, return and some of the other benefits. Yeah. Do you have, for your projects, uh, some um, hurdle rate of return that you have to get? Not for nonprofit finance fund ourselves. So yeah. just principal, so zero, so if principal gets repaid? In terms of the loans that we make? Uh -huh. In loans that we make, yes, apologies, we do have a return. So the way that most CDFIs are funded is that we receive uh, loans from banks for yes. the most part and foundations who can help us bring down our cost of capital. We need to, as an organization, repay that cost of capital and then, a, and then some to cover our cost of underwriting. So our loans are essentially market rate loans. The difference from a social perspective is that we tend to make smaller loans and riskier loans than most for-profit entities would be interested in making. Okay, so, so that's a, 
Would you say that's an important component to consider when we think about the impact yes, investing absolutely. structure? Absolutely. I think similarly to program related investments, you know, the sort of key to the definition is that it's a it's an investment that one would not make with the, expecting the same return. You're taking on inherently more risk than you would otherwise in a for-profit market. All right. Thank you. And there's a lot there as well. <laughs> um, but Steve, let's get your reflections on impact investing. Um, you're not going to have a lot of uh, disagreement among this panel. Um, <laughs> we're, we all uh, operate in the, travel in the same circles and see things in very similar fashions. Um, I really completely agree with everything that's been said on both sides. Um, but I'm very happy to uh, uh, take you up on your invitation uh, and talk a little bit about social impact bonds, which is a segment of the very broad spectrum that Paula talked about. And um, the, uh, the reason that this particular financial innovation is, uh, is being developed now is because of the success of philanthropy over the last 20 years, but also um, the limits on where it can go from here. So um, uh, venture philanthropy, the idea that a more disciplined measure uh, a focus um, on um, developing uh, social programs that can work um, delivered by organizations, social enterprises, who um, track their performance and are more thoughtful about the relationship between um, what the service they deliver and how change happens with populations that have very difficult, complex problems. Um, that, uh, that experiment, which has been conducted over the last 20, 10 to 20 years, has been successful. And philanthropy, especially the newer kinds of philanthropy, um, New Profit and the McConnell-Clark, um, uh, some of the innovative uh, funders out here, um, Omidyar is you know, a, a newer player and they represent something really new and important and different, um, but this is really before uh, Omidyar came on the scene, um, invested in this um, idea of venture philanthropy and social entrepreneurship to develop these innovations that could solve problems that we were unable to solve in the past. So things like um, homelessness, prisoner recidivism, um, children uh, and families who um, uh, they have a, a child abuse and neglect, the child has to be taken out of the home and either put in a residential facility or in foster care. Um, we know for sure after a good two decades of experimentation by very smart social innovators how to prevent or substantially reduce those very pervasive di um, disabling problems. Okay. Um, and it's a testament to um, a strategic focus of philanthropy that w we accomplish that. I wasn't around, but I'm, I'm a newcomer to the sector. But um, the challenge is that after many hundreds of millions of dollars and many, many years of development, um, we know the widget works. Okay? What we can't do is we can't make the widget available to everybody who needs it. Okay? We can't scale the innovation that we have. And that's a limitation of traditional philanthropy and also government funding. All right? And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. But uh, social impact bonds um, is asking the question, could private investment scale these proven innovations and basically take the handoff from traditional philanthropy and government funding? And we're talking, you know, if you look at some of our most successful social innovations, the, one of the examples that everybody uses is Nurse Family Partnership, okay? Uh, they've been around for 30 years. They've had three randomized control trials and many quasi-experimental studies. They're in uh, 30 or 40 states around the country, uh, excellent implementation model. Um, they achieve fantastic outcomes working with low-income mothers. Uh, first-time mothers when they're pregnant and for two years after their, their first child is born. And they, 
you know, they, they drastically reduce premature maternal death, uh, problem pregnancies, complicated births, developmental problems, and they've tracked their results for 18 years through the child's life, okay? And, um, you know, just incredible academic research demonstrates that there's a direct cause and effect relationship between their model, which is very carefully designed and very faithfully implemented and measured, and they know the outcomes they produce for 18 years, and they know how much money they save from which buckets of philanthropy and government. So public health, education, criminal justice, they know exactly you know, what a $9,000 investment saves you. And the result is, the answer is, that um, over the course of that 18 years, for every dollar that's invested in NFP, you save more than $5 in hard government savings, okay? These are not the soft costs like avoided victimization from crimes that didn't happen, okay? Or the emotional toll on families when, some, when somebody's pulled out of the home. They quantify those costs as well, you know, as a net matter of economic analysis. Um, but if you look at just the money that government doesn't spend, because of the nurse family intervention, it's $5 over the course of 18 years. Now even better, they break even. You get that dollar back within about five to seven years, okay? So, uh, but the thing that's astonishing is they're, they've got a big, big footprint. they are been around for 30 years. They've got all this research. They know how to set up operations in the state, train nurses, collect the data, manage the implementation, et cetera. Nationally, they serve 5% of the mothers who are eligible for their service, okay? And so I think that's a good case study. To me, that is proof positive that traditional philanthropy and government funding cannot scale an intervention a program as good as NFP, okay? So the question becomes, can private investment capital, all right? Now, NFP has a strategic um, objective of scaling some of their better, more established states to 50% of the, of the young mothers who need their service, okay? So we're talking about a five to 10X growth for the, the delivery, the service delivery, okay? And philanthropy doesn't finance five to 10X growth. You might do, in a good case, 10 or 20% growth year to year to year, okay? but that's never gonna get you to five to 10X growth. So that's what we're looking for with private capital and the, the idea that we're working on and we're still very much in the experimental stage is um, can we identify proven innovations that can be expanded by private capital that um, will reduce the demand for more expensive and less effective safety net services and generate savings that will more than pay for the programs that the private investment funded so we can use that extra money to pay in returns to investors, okay? So that's the proposition that we're just starting to get underway. Um, and the focus really is on preventive social services that can pay for themselves through monetizing future government savings. So thank you, Steve. I, I should just say this notion of social impact bonding is popping up all over the place. There's a, a lot of interaction between housing and healthcare. Sure. Um, and the issues that uh, are being encountered about how hard this is to do uh, in terms of finding just who's gonna fund the bond up front mm -hmm. uh, and what kind of evidence is needed mm -hmm. to uh, give, give the investor confidence mm -hmm. that that savings is actually gonna be realized. Right. It's, a, it's a very, very important question. And, right. um, I could talk for a long time on this, but, mm -hmm. but I will spare you. I wanted to, um, to turn a little bit to the impact part of impact investing and, um, and ask, how do you know when you've had the impact, um, what is an appropriate um, impact? And, and, and how would you think about success or failure? And, and how long are you looking to uh, to, to, to go before uh, you either say we've done it or we haven't. Um, Jessica, you want to start with that? or 
I, in some, I don't mean to keep deferring to you, but I feel like in some ways the, the philanthropy perspective is perhaps the best place to start. Um, sure. And I can, I can take it if you'd rather. So, so there's kind of two parts to your question, how do you think about impact, and then also this question of failure and success, obviously interrelated. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically, on the, when we're doing direct impact investing, picking a firm and then directly investing in it, um, we have a very extensive diligence process where basically, you know, this, in a way, kind of essentially what a traditional VC would do to, to vet the financial viability of a company plus a tremendous amount of work on the impact. Um, and, uh, and, and we will not invest in a company unless two things are present for us. One, we're totally convinced that this is a company that is all about impact and that the management team themselves are dedicated to this proposition. And two, and this is I suppose somewhat unique to a mid network, that the impact will scale as a di direct result of the product scaling or the service scaling. So for example, I mentioned that we um, invested in a company called D-Light, which produces solar lanterns, low-cost solar lanterns for, so for folks that don't have electricity. So each time a company sells one of those lanterns, it, they probably, it probably touches about four or five lives, you know, and these are kids who can't study at night for school or businesses that can't stay open or, you know, child people giving birth in the dark, right? It's, it's that, kind of, that kind of impact. Um, and, uh, and every time the company, the company's growing financial success is married to its ability to have impact or people wouldn't be buying this product. Right? That's the kind of proposition that we look for. And then we also measure on the back end with a tool called um, IRIS, which is a, a standard impact measurement tool within the industry, where it's kind of a, a bit of an alphabet soup of, like, can you, it's, it's very hard to kind of standardize impact across, you know, what is the impact of a solar lighting company versus um, a medical device for asthma versus giving someone access to a bank. Like, hard to compare apples and oranges, but so it's a bit of, you're, you're able to choose what you want to measure. We do that. Um, and then we look also at the systems level impact and is the market growing, not just is the firm growing, um, and is it moving forward and serving more customers? Um, and is it serving the sort of the target client of usually a disadvantaged population? So, uh, the question of failure and success is a really interesting one. And this is a really young field, right? So in a way, the sort of the jury is a bit still out about, despite all the hype, about what's really going on here, <laughs> how successful these companies are financially and in terms of impact. And I think it's important to keep that in mind and have sort of realistic expectations of that. Microfinance took 30 years to develop. It still reaches like a tiny fraction of the clientele. And the question of its impact is still being investigated, right? Um, I think it's, it's, for us, interesting to note sort of some places where things ha like happened successfully versus what they didn't to help us improve our chances of impact going forward. And one thing that's interesting to me, going back to the solar lighting example, is the importance of policy, which sort of hit everyone like, uh, you know, like this huge surprise, like, oh my god, we have to, we really, we have to pay attention to policy? That's so surprising. Um, but so for solar lighting, um, D-Light, which has been phenomenally successful, their first, the first place where they gained a lot of ground was in Africa. Um, and even though they put a tremendous amount of effort into India, they're only starting to gain traction there. Why? Because India has a kerosene subsidy. Africa does not. Similarly, mobile payments, right? So um, one of the big sort of success stories in mobile payments, which sort of allows people that don't have formal financial services to, you know, pay for inputs into their business or transfer money to their relatives or whatnot, um, is in Pesa in Kenya. And the reason, and it, Pesa handles something like a third of GDP goes is processed through Pesa in Kenya. So hugely important for that economy. Um, but has had a, a more difficult time spreading to other countries nearby. And the reason for that is that at, the other countries have not been able to be as creative about finding a policy solution that both, you know, in terms of mobile payments, people are worried about money laundering, right? 
So M-Pesa and the, the government of Kenya said, okay, we'll, we'll figure out a solution where we're, mon we're monitoring, you can all, like, we'll put a limit on how much money you can transfer, et cetera, et cetera. Neighboring countries where, frankly, there are people that don't want this disruption to happen because there are big businesses that would be threatened by this, um, are, you know, working with the government to make sure that the policy is not adopted, right? So, so I would say one of, the, one of the learnings and kind of one of the f sort of failures of the early field is the, the failure to recognize how important policy is. And I see that shifting as we move but forward. But also, which policies you should mm -hmm. pay attention yeah. to? Yeah. Because this yeah. kerosene thing yeah. is seemingly unrelated <laughs> to solar power um, in some level. Yeah. Uh, and the use of lamps. Yeah. Because kerosene is not going to help you for the things yeah. you're interested in. But it plays an important role. So that, that's actually quite interesting. Jessica? Yeah. So it's an interesting question around success and failure. I think. Historically, we haven't done enough at the philanthropic or the government level to capture and really pay for what works. You know, if we go back to the CRF example, the Community Resilience Fund I gave in New York City, if Clark Foundation had said to us, you know, you haven't made any grants to human service providers and that's what you said you would do with this money, that was failure. We changed the question and we got to addressing more of the social challenge around, well, why haven't we been able to lend out any of this money to human service organizations? And we really got to more of the societal challenge around, these are fragile organizations that we can't lend money to right now without, without also investing in building them up as organizations and as safety net providers. I think at the government level, we've seen the same thing. There's a quote that one of our colleagues in the social impact bond space often um, puts forward that when we look at the 10 largest federally funded programs, only one of those programs at the federal level has actually proven to be successful in terms of an intervention, and that's Head Start. Now, that means that for decades, we are funding things that have not shown to work, okay? And so, you know, at, at, at some point, what we see happening with the social impact fund movement or, or enthusiasm around it, Raphael, is, is not to say that this is a perfect mechanism, but that it starts to get at integrating some of the questions that, and some of the issues that we've been tackling for quite some time. One of those is around, can we more effectively use declining government dollars? Can we more effectively capitalize and take advantage of and leverage philanthropic dollars? And can we also open up private markets so that we really do get at this place of maintaining social services and a safety net in the wake of macroeconomic and demographic pressures. I mean, that's, that's sort of what's at the heart of this. And so we're at a point in time where there's an, an increased ability for us to <coughs> capture data in the first place and then to actually start to track outcomes. Now, historically, that's been an incredibly expensive proposition. Randomized controls tests are not inexpensive. There's a reason that we continue to talk about nurse family partnership and a handful of other examples over and over again, right? I, we, we did a webinar recently with um, an organization in Massachusetts that's going to be participating in a social impact bond in that state. The organization is an organization by the name of Broca that goes out and finds the hardest to reach young men and women on the street and really forces them, doesn't force them, but really tries to get them in to receive services. I mean, this is an organization that is reaching the highest risk youth. And this organization has spent seven years defining how do we do this effectively. They've gone through three theories of change. That's not an inexpensive or a quick process, right? But because they have done that, they are actually able to go into the social impact bond transaction and invest in their own ability to achieve that outcome. Meaning that they are in, in fact investing as a philanthropy would or as a private investor might, so that if the outcomes they propose to achieve are reached, they themselves recognize a return on their own investment. That's revolutionary for the nonprofit market, to be able to actually generate dollars because you've achieved the outcome you set out to achieve. So, Many organizations, I'm sure many of us are thinking about the organizations that you fund, many nonprofit groups are not ROCA, quite honestly. They are small organizations. They are those 57% that have less than three months of cash on hand and can't take a risk like that on themselves. Right? I think what else we've seen in the last few years is that in light of the recession, many nonprofits are even weaker than they were in 2007 and 2008. What happens when government dollars decline, when philanthropic capital declines? We try our best to maintain programs because we're seeing an increase in demand for those programs. 
but at the same time, we've cut our infrastructure. Right? We have less people doing more things. And you know, if we're now at this place where we've got these fragile organizations that are meeting demands, more and more demands, I think we have an opportunity here to really start to invest more, particularly from philanthropic investments, invest more in the infrastructure and the ability of these organizations to both think about what it is they're setting out to achieve and then go about tracking that and capturing that data so we have more organizations like ROCA who can really, who we can invest in and we can know that we're using our dollars wisely in terms of so addressing social So if I could, if I could just ask a question on that, is there, is there a role for the funder to demand things of the nonprofit so that they approach it like ROCA? I mean, is there, is, 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 did ROCA just kind of figure it out on their own and, and got, get lucky? Or are there, are there things that, that can be more actively done yeah. to get more organizations like that? As someone who works with, as an organization that works with nonprofits, I think demand is probably not the right way to go. Of Support, course, we're, we're and, and of course it's here, a, so. you know, a choice of words. <laughs> but I think it's actually, it's important. You know, it's not just semantics, that it's actually about being a philanthropic partner to organizations, and quite honestly, making. But, but let, me, let me just push back a little bit yeah. here. As the funder who's looking mm -hmm. for a return, mm -hmm. you are an important partner who should be able to bring your values and your, your goals to the conversation. So, so mm -hmm. while I understand that it is a partnership, there, are so, there is some structure that a funder could introduce into this that could be helpful. Do you, do you think, do you guys bring those sorts of conversations to your funds? We do, but I think we're saying the same thing, Raphael, in many ways, is that bring that support, bring that infrastructure. Don't, you know, it's, it's unfair in some ways to assume that an organization that is spending all of the programmatic funding that they get doing their programs has also somehow come up with a way to subsidize evaluating those programs. I think we need to acknowledge that nonprofits exist to address market inefficiencies, right? They are organizations that often don't get paid for the full cost of their services. And so inherent in any nonprofit organization is not just that they're addressing a mission, right? That they're out there trying to house homeless or get folks out of domestic violence situations, but that they also need to leverage the work they're doing by fundraising, by really covering the full cost that government has not provided. So I think it's inherent on us as a philanthropic sector to think about, you know, what is the reality that nonprofits face and how can we use our dollars to, yes, get them to a place where they are able to talk about the outcomes, um, but also that we have given them the tools to do so. And I do think, to your point, Raphael, not every organization is a, is a ROCA. I mean, that is the simple reality. And what that implies for philanthropy is not necessarily my place to say, but, you know, I, I think we make different investments in different organizations. You know, you do at some point choose to make bets and invest in organizations that you think are ROCA-like, for lack of a better word in this conversation. So this is an interesting question. I think this is a, a key thing that every funder has to think about. You know, what is the nonprofit trying to do? So they all don't just do market inefficiencies, mm -hmm. uh, but many do, and in those instances, you know, what is their ability and capacity to build up that extra uh, structural infrastructure so that they can be a fully functional organization right. and not just do the short-term service provision. That's important. And then funders have a, have a choice to make about you know, what are the, the outcomes or to what extent is outcome going to drive their funding decisions and then ultimately their long-run sustained engagement with these organizations. So mm -hmm. these points are, are really important and I think they become more important in an impact investing context where you know, presumably the impact is where we're, go where we're mm -hmm. trying to get to. So you know, Steve, did you want to jump in on this? In fact, I want to be a little bit of a skunk at the garden party, if I may. <laughs> um, Love skunks. <laughs> we have to understand that impact investing is not philanthropy. Okay? There is a very important and catalytic role for philanthropy in impact investing. Okay, but the reason we're doing this is because we're trying to accomplish something that philanthropy cannot do, okay, and um, so and doesn't know how to do, frankly, okay, and government doesn't know how to do it. And and just what exactly is that? that the, the, it's exactly uh, uh, what she just said, which is that we need an alternative way. We need a way to scale what works. 
and it needs to scale it so big that it's an alternative for our failing safety net system in our unsustainable uh, fiscal situation in this country, okay? Um, we have a new normal that we don't know how to live within. The old normal does not work, okay? We can't keep going with this many incarcerated people, with this many uh, people, young children going into foster care or residential care, this many homeless people. Uh, uh, we're gonna have a problem with low-income seniors who have a health problem. We can't put them all in expensive nursing homes. We need some other kind of care that doesn't exist right now. Um, uh, these are problems of scale that uh, philanthropy and um, government funding cannot address on their own. It's not because they're too dumb or they don't care, or they don't get it. Um, the dynamics of philanthropy and government funding cannot grow these proven innovations by factors of five to 10x and more, which is what we need. Um, and so the hypothesis is that maybe private investment can uh, uh, be a disruptive innovation that can cross the chasm of growth in a way that um, the existing tool set isn't able to. And so what, what I would say, going back to your original question about impact, is that we need to be, this is, th we need to be very strategic about uh, how we develop this new model of private financing. Um, and um, if you think about it, we're, we're combining a lot of different things and we hope we'll achieve orders of magnitude more impact, okay? And there are, and it very much is at a proof of concept stage. We haven't accomplished anything yet, okay? Uh, we think we know how to go about it, okay? Um, it is uh, incumbent upon us to be there, very thoughtful about how we, where we choose to start, okay? Let's pick interventions that have clear, unambiguous, measurable outcomes, okay? Um, the only R&D that we want right now with social impact bonds in order to prove the concept is the financial innovation, okay? If I raise money from private investors, can I invest it in preventive social programs that will reduce government expenditures and pay back the investors, okay? That's the big, uh, breakthrough that I need to demonstrate, that we need to demonstrate, okay? So let's not, we can't do that with social programs that are untested or unproven or we don't know what the impacts are or we can't quantify or the data is unreliable or there are questions about the service delivery. So basically, if we're trying to focus on this financial innovation that we hope has catalytic horsepower that philanthropy and government funding haven't had, Okay, let's take as much of the uncertainty and the unknown variables out of the equation as we can and find the ROCAs and the nurse family partnerships and intensively focus on them with the resources they need, with expectations that are reasonable and you know, that are collaboratively agreed in advance that this is what we're trying to accomplish. And if I could just add one thing on that, and I know you want to jump in making sure that we understand where the payback is going to come from yep. is critical. Yes. Now, I, I worry about when the savings are in the government because that money gets funded, gets moved to other budget line items. Yes. And some of the things that we're seeing um, and the stuff that I've been involved in is that you've got to find private organizations who will see that come back to them yeah. in bottom line stuff. And, I'll just offer one observation about that. I, I come from government, so and I'm very, I'm not at all anti-government. I just, you know, they, they, there's a lot of good people in government who are frustrated by their inability to, to be more effective and they can't deal with the new normal. Um, they like this, many of them like this new approach a lot. Um, it, but they, there are major structural challenges about capturing savings and you know, future, you know, having long-term programs. You know, the governor who signed this contract was, you know, was replaced by somebody else, and there's a whole new legislature who's supposed to pay millions of dollars under a contract, and so on. Okay, those are real problems. They are, I believe, solvable, but they're 
l serious problems. Th the important thing to think about when you think about government is that is where the um, non-monetized uh, inefficiencies are in spades. There's a lot of money waiting to be captured there. Okay? <coughs> so in terms of a essentially a revenue stream the, of, of avoided expenditures, okay, government is the place to go if you can overcome these those challenges. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. You, you wanted to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to jump in and, and um, cause I, I, I by and large agreed with a lot of what you said, um, <laughs> but I would, at least from ON's perspective, clarify some of the message that could be extrapolated from that. Um, and, and I would say, you know, yes, there are certain problems that philanthropy and government have not been able to scale. There are other problems that philanthropy has done really well with scaling. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think at least from ON's perspective, the message is not here like, all right, this is now the answer to everything, particularly oh, yeah. that it's new and untested. Um, we, you know, we have a several, several verticals in which we invest and in which we try to find for-profit deals, but really this is like, it's a philanthropic play. We work on property rights all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. I think we found like one for-profit company and the rest are grants. Um, and that's for a reason, right? So I think one of the mottos that we use internally um, is problem first, tool second. Mm -hmm. And you asked, um, you know, for two takeaways for, mm -hmm. for people to think about. So for me, that would be one of them is, is really like, okay, if you're evaluating impact investing, it's really about what problem are you trying to solve, you know, and is there is there a market-based technique that could help you scale that problem? And the answer is not always yes. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Um, and then the second thing t is, uh, I, and I guess I would also point out, sometimes the answer is both, right? Like microfinance started with like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of grants, right? Mm -hmm. And before the model got proven and could actually become viably for profit and then for-profit capital came in. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the, the second takeaway that I would suggest is also, and this is something we frequently encounter with folks that are, that are considering impact investing, is, is to think carefully about the way that your organization thinks about risk. And, and I think that's something that we also had to do in our, in our own evolution, which is, you know, there are a lot of folks who will say, especially within the context of a foundation, okay, we do grants, and then we have our portfolio management, and the two teams are very separate. And then uh, the idea of a program-related investment will come up, and the portfolio managers will say, the investment professionals will say, that's really, that's too risky. Like, you know. And then on the other hand, you take a step back and you're like, okay, wait a second. We are willing to lose 100% of principal. That's not risky. But we're not willing to make something where we might have a knock on our, a little bit of a knock on our return, mm -hmm. right? So but it's really important to think about risk in that and, and, and really think about it carefully because that's sort of like going back to what Jessica said, mm -hmm. kind of the whole essence of impact investing is to be able to take the risks where the markets would not necessarily do so to be able to catalyze positive development on behalf of underserved populations or the environment, so. Thank you. Um, we're now in part three, which is the takeaway <laughs> section. Um, do one of the, uh, Jessica or Steve, you want to offer some takeaways? Take yeah. Sure. I, uh, Paula, I liked that as well. I, one of the things that I was thinking about was really this ability for philanthropy and foundations to bridge the gap or the divide perhaps between their program officers and their investment officers. I think impact investing is a very interesting space to think about are there local market players or investors that have an interest in seeding social impact funds that have a, a collective interest in perhaps building the infrastructure in a local community. The second thing that I would, I would say is, you know, we've talked a lot about asking the right questions. I, I also liked your point that this is not about the tool. This is about what challenge are we trying to face and how can we best do that. And I think some ways, thinking about that complete capital approach, you know, can philanthropic dollars incite or lubricate the entry of private market dollars into a new space. Um, that's another way that we can think about playing a role in the evolution of impact investing from the philanthropic sector. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is really about kind of deepening our obligation, our sense of obligation to each other and to our communities. Um, and, you know, I think when we start to get into this is not a bifurcated world where investments make money and philanthropy generates social good, 
we need to start thinking about how do we generate social goods from investments and do we as a society believe in that commitment that you know, we have an obligation to take care of each other. I, I do want to take off on the complete capital point, yeah. which is really critical and I completely agree with your sort of reframing of what I said. I, th this social impact bond is for a certain set of problems that we know how to solve, but we don't know how to scale, uh -huh. okay? And we're hoping that private investment capital used in this particular way could um, break through the, some of the limitations. Um, th th this is a, a, a new opportunity for philanthropy to, to ha play a different role in the capital stack that we need. So one of the things that's important about uh, scaling is um, you uh, take on projects that um, are, you know, would give nosebleeds to most foundations and even nonprofit organizations. Uh, you know, you, you know, would you like a fifty million dollar grant? No, we can't absorb that. Okay, right. but we need fifty million dollar social impact bond projects, and so far. We've only had five or ten million dollar projects, okay? Um, and we're, the way that we're going to get there is with stacked capital. And you're not going to find commercial investors who are going to put fifty million dollars into an organization as great as Roca. They're not ready for it, okay? Um, um, right. But um, if you had a foundation that put in a layer of capital to be the first loss, if it doesn't work, okay? Um, or to provide a guarantee fund or a reserve, okay, that will absorb some of the loss if the outcome metrics aren't achieved and the government doesn't have to pay, okay, then you're going to attract commercial capital um, to round out the capital stack. And that's what we saw, if you know the uh, New York City deal, by the way, with Goldman Sachs, $10 million isn't a lot of money to them, but it is a lot of money for a, you know, for a social program. Um, and Bloomberg Philanthropy uh, put a 75% guarantee in place that enabled the risk return profile to get through the investment committee at Goldman Sachs. So they evaluated it like a commercial loan, okay? And without the guarantee, the numbers wouldn't work, okay? Now, we don't have billionaire mayors in every city who can be on both sides of the transaction the way that uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies in New York City was. But we certainly have foundations who could play that same kind of role, okay? So, um, you know, this is um, a great new opportunity. There are definitely uh, foundations and high net worths and, you know, the new breed of more market-oriented foundation like Omidyar, okay, really get how they can be catalytic here. Okay, and they're and they and they also understand capital markets in the way that you know older style foundations don't necessarily. Okay, or at least on the program mm -hmm. side. Um, so there's expertise that we can draw on that might enable us to accomplish much more audacious um, uh, goals um, than we could if everybody was you know trying to do it on their own. Well, thank you all for those takeaways. Very, very interesting food for thought. What I want to do now is open it up to the floor. And if there are questions, uh, we've got about 15, 20 minutes. Let's go through them. I think it touches on what you just uh, got at. But I'm curious, I mean, I think that you all described very pragmatically kind of narrowing the field of sort of fundable organizations, particularly in these early stages of impact investing. And, and that sort of older, maybe, um, uh, organizations with some history and credibility and, his and uh, experience and the ability to measure and you know some of the things that you listed like with Roca, um, that you know that those big organizations frequently aren't the most innovative you know as compared to a lot of other um, smaller nonprofits. And so I'm curious if we're if we're naturally um, I mean I understand why we're doing it, but what the implications of, of uh, kind of leaving out small, riskier, more innovative nonprofits are. And then maybe for people who are more local on the philanthropy side, if there's a role for them locally to look at it with some willingness to absorb obviously the added risk, but almost more like a VC for funding startups, yeah. right? I mean, it's a well, shift that's as compared to a big bank and, and, and what that would mean. Could you, and could, could, could you introduce yourself, I'm sorry. I'm Don Morgan, I'm here in the high school. Okay. 
So, Don, I think it's a great question, <clears throat> and we've talked a lot about ROCA today. What we haven't talked about is the two organizations that are <clears throat> the service providers in the New York City transaction, which are not ROCA. They are very small organizations that are working on Rikers Island to provide intermediation services. There's an intermediary in that transaction, MDRC, which is a larger, mm -hmm. more well-established intermediary. So, yes, I think there's almost... This, as, you know, this is a nascent field. This can go as many ways as folks who are sitting around the table signing that contract are willing to let this go. New York City is an interesting example, though. For We could go the path of saying, okay, Roca, you've got this great innovative program. You've proven it. Or we could go the path of saying, MDRC, you understand the social issue here, and you have these service providers on the ground that are smaller, that are innovative, and are providing these services. You also have a five- to seven-year window to demonstrate an outcome. If those service providers aren't working, you can replace them with others who are, who are more innovative. So I think there's actually an ability here. And again, this is all somewhat theoretical. But there is an ability here for organizations not to be able to, not to have to do everything, but for us to really recognize that these intractable, difficult, complicated, multi-tiered problems take more than one type of an approach. You know, if we're preventing folks from going back to prison, we're talking about job training. We're talking about you know, substance abuse issues. We're talking about a lot of different issues where we could, in fact, as a community, bring together those players that are on the front lines, that are innovating, to say, OK, you work with this subsector of the cohort. You work with this subsector of the cohort. And I think that collective impact approach is another way in which, you know, we haven't talked about it so much here today, but is one way that we could get at that where we're not necessarily leaving behind the small players, but in fact, bringing them together in a way that allows us collectively to achieve sort of a meta outcome, recognizing that that meta outcome requires different interventions on the ground. I think locally, <clears throat> we're seeing um, a number of foundations, excuse me, and, and public uh, agencies come together in a new organization called LA in Sync. Now, LA in Sync is a collaborative that will be announced formally in the next month or so. So I apologize to you for seeding any sort of formal announcements here. Don't um, tell anybody. <laughs> don't, don't tell anybody. But this is an organization, you know, this is a group of funders and city agencies that are really interested in having more federal grant dollars directed to Los Angeles County. You know, as I think many of us who are local in the room know, <coughs> that's been a difficult task in the past years because we are such a large county, because we are so disparate and there are so many you know, neighborhoods and communities here in Los Angeles. If we can come together on that level to apply for federal funds, what we're essentially doing is saying, what are the programs that work here on the ground? We're enabling a channel to cross-pollinate you know, cross good ideas and to really generate multi-tiered support for those organizations, for those programs and projects that are you know, really having the outcomes we desire. Can, can I say, I think we um, need to um, uh, deal with um, sort of a harsh reality of that we're trying this audacious experiment with impact investing, okay? And we have to discipline ourselves um, to make some choices, okay? And um, taking a, an innovative nonprofit with a, with a good promising idea that isn't up to speed on performance measurement and data collection yet, would like to, but isn't there yet, to put them inside of a social impact bond where everything is dependent on the achievement of measurable outcomes is unfair to everybody. And it ratchets up the risk very significantly, okay? ROCA, um, became such a, uh, a, a measurement-driven organization because they're, they're not that big. They're big for a nonprofit, but they're, they're only a 10 or $12 million organization. Um, they're only in two sites, okay? They serve a few hundred really challenging kids. Um, they developed this performance measurement capability and theories of change and everything because they decided they couldn't they couldn't be as effective as they needed to be um, to help these kids unless they had that capacity. And so they went through the ordeal of developing that in-house, they managed to get some funding, and they built this capacity. So they're like, you know, perfect candidate for this kind of thing, all right? But it took them a long, long time, and it's grueling, and it's hard. Um, we, we shouldn't uh, experiment with too many variables at one time. 
You don't have to. I, know, I, I guess <clears throat> my only uh, clarification on that would be, uh, I think most of impact investing, a lot of it is, fo is focused on early stage. Um, and, and at least at ON, um, we, uh, we almost only do early stage, and if it's a for-profit, we give we do equity, and if it's a non-profit, we do grants, and if it's somewhere in between, sometimes in some cases we've given equity and grants, right? We're broken an organization into two entities. So I think there's a there's a ton of examples in that regard as well. The social impact bond case is a specific and slice. Paula, just to build on that yeah. a little bit, I think you know it's absolutely true. We we hear all the time the need for less than hundred thousand dollar investments in growing social yeah. enterprise, and that's an incredibly impactful investment into yeah. a social enterprise that most organizations aren't interested in making. It's just too small, <laughs> and most venture firms aren't too interested in making as well. So there's a role for philanthropy there in growing the pipeline of deals so that right. this market can become more liquid and work more as a you know as a genuine market. Yeah. Right. Next question. We have one here. <clears throat> I am Dan Mazzocca from the California Association of Nonprofits, and also I'm working with a group of people to start a federal credit union for nonprofits. Um, but most, of, I mean, I'm more interested in we've kind of narrowed this, we've narrowed this discussion a lot to social impact bonds. So I just wanted to ask a question about those. I mean, it's like if the savings are they're savings to government, is what they really are. Okay. And so I just am, I was reminded that like my husband came home a few weeks ago and said I just saved. So, um, because he uh, because he bought one on sale, all right. And so the thing is, after I can understand what you're saying for like the first period, but ten years out, isn't government going to be saying like next year he's going to say to me I saved eight hundred dollars on suit this year by not buying one at all, right? So how do those quote unquote savings not end up just being a per in perpetuity government grant transfer of government money to private investors? If I could just jump in just to <coughs> refine the premise a little bit. In many of these instances, the savings don't necessarily have to go to government. Right? In a health context, it could be an insurance company. There are going to be situations where the private, where private organizations are um, really going to realize some benefits. But this question about if government is the beneficiary, how, does, how do you manage that? And particularly in a recurring situation, um, that's, a, that's a, a, an important question. The savings is, is a means to an end here. It's a, it's a financial engine to expand innovative programs that are more effective. Okay, if we, if we, if we depend, we've been asking for decades for more government funding like for programs like ROCA and it hasn't been forthcoming and it's, that's not, it's gonna happen even less now given the, you know, the future financial situation. So if we want to expand these programs, which we desperately need to do, we need to find a way to pay for them. And for a certain set of programs, um, savings um, can be self-financing if we can extract those savings, okay? And so this is, I would say that in terms of, you made the point of this isn't a panacea, this isn't for everything. Um, that's definitely true. It's for a, a, a small number of interventions that serve an awful lot of people and cost the government a tremendous amount of money. So if savings becomes the dynamic force that supports the expansion of more effective prevention programs, okay, then um, that's a scalable, replicable, long-term alternative to paying for uh, problems after they occur and not really solving them. So we don't mean this to be one-off, and it's not about um, a way to cut budgets. It's about to shift from ineffective, uh, reactive programs to effective prevention programs that we can afford. Other questions? Yes, right here. So Gregory McGinnity with the Eli and Edith Broad Foundation. Um, you, you talked a little bit, Paula, about the issue of policy that you faced in, in some of the countries. My, the challenge we have in K-12 education, I think, is somewhat policy, but also ideology. And, and the, way I've, the way we've tried to think about it is, you know, if you think about the Defense Department, for example, the Defense Department can't operate without Northrop Grumman. You think about Medicare and Medicaid, you can't operate those programs without private hospitals, with doctors, et cetera. When it comes to K-12 education, there is this absolute barrier about thinking 
about using the private sector and the energy and innovation of the private sector to somehow find different ways to fix a, a significant problem we have in educating all of our kids. Um, how, what kinds of barriers have you faced in trying to utilize those kinds of investments um, in for-profits in the United States versus where you don't have those kind of ideological barriers potentially overseas? And then on the social impact bond issue that we've talked a little bit about, is there a concern essentially that Goldman Sachs is making money off homeless kids, right? That that kind of ideological response, whether or not you're actually fixing the problem, is going to come in and sort of wipe out the ability to actually solve the problem first, regardless of the tools, because everybody goes to the tool question first in these conversations. The problem is, uh, I mean, you put your finger on the heart of, like, if there's any risk that I'm most worried about for the field, it's that, right? Like that, you know, we had a crisis in microfinance in India two years ago, um, where it was kind of exactly that claim being made. And for whatever reason, the field was like, oh, OK, India. Not like, actually, this is a universal set of issues that's going to affect any time you're using a market-based approach to serve disadvantaged populations. You're going to be, I, I would state it both in two ways. I would say, one, you want to be incredibly careful and collaborative and work with policymakers and local advocates and the communities to make sure that consumer protection is, is being, you know, is robust and that um, and that uh, poor customers are able to access, you know, the highest quality products at reasonable costs, right? And that this business is being done responsibly. I would also say, on the other hand, you need to be realistic and understand this is highly political and charged, and that there's there is going to be this risk of, you know, this kind of the. Um, idea of like you're profiting off of the poor um, is this incredibly complex political debate um, and that sometimes there are also frankly vested interests where like you know even in the, the case of microfinance like early money lenders who were charging you know really really exorbitant rates didn't want microfinance to occur right um, so the bottom line here being this is, this is a huge issue that affects the entire field and being very proactive and working with the community and policymakers to, you know, and there's a, we could get into a really long conversation about what those host of policies are that make, that sort of ensures the best outcome for these communities. But thinking about that up front, like, it is incredibly important to the success of those efforts. I would absolutely agree. I, you know, I think, yes, absolutely, there's already that feedback and that reverberation from Goldman investing at the same time that it also opened up a lot of interest from commercial players into this space. Um, one of the things that when we work with governments we say is I think my, my personal view is it's most important that there's a government champion managing this process and that the, the messaging around it goes out as such. Um, you know, if that requires that, Jan, almost to your, your earlier question, that the government puts a full faith and credit backing in you know, supporting the future repayments, so be it, that change needs to happen. Um, but you know, I think the other, the other sort of systems issue that we bump up against is not just the public perception where, quite frankly, you could argue the same thing was true with low-income housing tax credits, that those are private folks you know, making money off the poor. It's not quite as egregious. It's not quite as in-your-face kids going back to prison or not. But it's a similar concept. The other thing that I think we need to think about all of these challenges up front, because they are challenges, is that when we talk about impacting these outcomes, when we really start to generate savings on reducing recidivism, we're closing prisons. We're getting rid of jobs. You know, we are affecting unions when we have less people working in those systems, less people in the emergency room. And so there are these market shifts that we need to, in some ways, acknowledge and deal with head on. I don't know that we know how to deal with them quite yet, um, except to really confront them and acknowledge that, yes, we are talking about changing systems here. We're also talking about shrinking government dollars and you know, the fact that philanthropy can't fill that gap. And the other way to do that is to access private markets. So I think as you know, society, we do need to address some of these tough questions. And while it's important that we focus on the challenge, also remember why we're, why we're looking at these opportunities and really that we are in a new, a new state of being, a new normal. All right, so we have time for one more question. Um, I saw a hand in the back, but that hand is not up anymore. So. Um, <laughs> 
Are there, are there any other questions? If not, um, I, I want to say a few closing words as my prerogative as a moderator. So I started by asking the question, uh, what is impact investing? And I think what we've heard very clearly is that it is about complicated structured finance and organizational relationships between uh, market players and markets that have or have not formed with an overlay of policy. Um, this is not easy stuff. And what we've seen here are three different models uh, or approaches, all of how you, you structure these financial arrangements and how you engage the market and pick which places to operate. Um, a lot of takeaways here. And hopefully you've got um, the six that they offered. Uh, and it gives you food for thought as you think about how your organizations fit into that capital stack. Uh, and how you move your financial investments uh, to have those social impacts. So I want to thank, personally thank all of our panelists, Jessica, Steve, and Paula. You were fantastic, uh, and please join me in thanking them. And enjoy the rest of the conference. This has been a wonderful one.